So I have, I'm going to do a formal introduction for the TV camera. So I'm Peter Conlon. Uh, I'm the state rep for Hancock, uh, Goshen, Ripton, Leicester, Salisbury, and Cornwall. And I'm a resident of Cornwall. Um, ben, go ahead and introduce yourself. Ben Jickling. I'm a rep of Granville, as well as uh, Randolph, Burkefield, Braintree, and Roxbury. And I live over in Granville. And uh, Jay Hooper is the other rep for Granville. Um, He's doing the penguin plunge later today up in Burlington. Uh, so he may be just sitting by the heat and getting heated up before he has to go do that. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you for coming and please eat some food. I don't want to haul it all back with me. Um, but just thought maybe Ben and I would talk a minute about um, what, what our role has been at the legislature. We're both in our second term there, our second, actually our second year of a, of a two year term, um, uh, as is Jay. Uh, I'm on the education committee. And uh, so at this point in the session this year, a lot of the work is happening in the committees as opposed to out on the house floor, uh, because that's where all the legislation has to begin. And uh, there's actually a lot of, big issues going on in the education committee. Um, we, and this is just on the House side, of course, the Senate side is doing their own thing, but we are looking at um, some rather uh, big changes in how we fund special, ed special education in our schools. Uh, I know for you folks, school issues are, are you know, you, you have you tuition all your kids, so the school issues remain with the, the schools, but this could be a, a big change in how we fund special education that we feel will lead to better results and over a number of years some savings and the idea is right now when it comes to special education which is about i think it's about somewhere i think it's a 300 million dollar bill every pay each year uh, schools for every minute they spend with a with a child who's on an individual education plan basically that's the definition of a special ed child you have to account for every minute you're with them, and the amount of paperwork is just unbelievable. And you also can't give the kids the service that is reimbursable by the state um, unless they're on an IEP, and unless they're being taught by a special education teacher. So in, in broad terms, we're looking at moving to a model where you basically give school districts the money they would normally receive and let them do what they think is best with it for special education. And the goal being that kids who may not yet be in special ed can get the specialized services that they need with this money and hopefully prevent them from being um, on an IEP later. And we feel that, first of all, the, the, it gets rid of a lot of bean counting, a lot of bean counting. Um, and would hopefully allow schools more flexibility to do what they really think would be best for a kid without having to worry about whether the money is going to be reimbursed or not. Uh, we're also about to get a bill from the Ways and Means Committee. They're in charge of raising money, raising or, you know, setting tax rates and all that. But it's on how we raise money for education and relying less on property taxes and shifting more of it to income. And really, we already rely significantly on income because even though we pay property taxes, so many people have what's called income sensitivity that we're two thirds of the people who pay property taxes pay based on income rather than actual property taxes. The idea would be to kind of chuck that system and really uh, make it a much more understandable, much more easily defined system that still relies somewhat on property taxes, not as much, but a bunch of it would then shift to the income tax, feeling that that's more progressive, um, but also make it a heck of a lot easier to explain to people how it works, because boy, it's real hard right now. So that, and then we're dealing with some pre-kindergarten issues. That's kind of those are the three main topics we have going on in the um, uh, education committee. And Ben, I'll let you talk about what, what you're doing on your committee. Sure. So I'm on the health care committee. Um, oh, it's also a big one. Yeah. <laughs> there's a number of uh, big issues that we've been dealing with. Uh, so I'm just going to hit on three. One, there's a number of um, things happening on the federal level around health care. Who's uh, Jay? Hey, you. Uh, hi, Jay. Um, about the Trump administration made some changes to uh, 
cost sharing reductions, which are uh, help people be able to afford their premium and make sure that insurance companies offer uh, large, you know, are able to offer a, a wide amount of benefits to a wide amount of people. Uh, so that was about $13 million we spent the last couple of weeks dealing with that and figuring out uh, that type of solution that actually will give Vermonters more money than they had before. Um, it's really complicated. But um, we're, you know, spent a significant amount of time addressing those changes that are coming down from the federal level. Um, the second area is the mental health system, which I'm sure it's been in the news a lot. Um, we're really struggling with the flow through the system and capacity at a lot of our, you know, our highest level one um, facilities, treatment hospitals. So uh, the governor's budget had some money in it um, to explore building a couple of uh, additional units. Um, to make sure that we can get the flow going um, because you know what we're hearing from emergency rooms what we're hearing from uh, mental health professionals is people are showing up with, with a higher acuity of, of, of symptoms and they're staying a lot longer in inpatient facilities so that's leading to a lot of backlog and a lot of people frankly sitting in the ER for days weeks even months waiting to get into a available bed so that's something that we'll be spending a lot of time um, figuring out what you know structural changes as well as different investments we can make um, to get the system to a more sustainable level. And uh, finally, something that I've been particularly interested in is uh, we're in a broad you know area of healthcare reform in terms of moving to this all pay payer model, um, which changes how we pay for healthcare. Um, not it won't affect consumers in any way, but it you know, affects the, the payer, the insurance company, to the provider, the hospital, the doctor. Um, and I've got some real concerns about how rural healthcare providers are, are being impacted by this and how they fit in the picture. Uh, because I don't know how it is uh, you know, on this side of the mountain, but over in the, you know, over in the Randolph area, we really struggle to attract primary care doctors, be able to get in and see our doctors, um, and I'm not convinced that this this new uh, direction of healthcare reform will adequately protect you know access to a lot of our rural communities, which is which is much of Vermont. Uh, so those are a couple of the key issues that uh, we on healthcare are dealing with. Um, there's no shortage. We've been putting in some long hours, but uh, it's uh, keeping us busy. So. All right. Yeah, I just uh, well, just getting settled. I'll just say that Ben and I both serve on. Um, what's called the Rural Economic Development Working Group. Yeah, we just call it the Rural Caucus for short. And we're just a group of legislators from rural areas that we just keep an eye on and support legislation in support of rural communities. And uh, so we've kind of focused on a couple of things this year. Um, one, the, the, we had a, a big hearing that we opened up to the state in November to just say, come in and tell us what your concerns are around the state. It was for, you know, for rural folks to come in and talk about that. Really heard um, two or three main things. One, uh, broadband access in rural areas. I think tied with that would be cellular access. You guys are incredibly lucky over here to have a strong AT&T signal. Folks in Ripton and whatnot are, definitely don't have it. Uh, uh, and then um, rural wastewater systems uh, as um, rural areas try to build or try to, you know, say we maintain or attract business or even more housing um, as our wastewater rules keep getting tighter and tighter. Uh, that clearly means that communities are going to need more and more support in order to put in adequate systems, especially if they want to cluster their development. That's why I asked you about the tail and meadow development. I was curious as to know how, the, how they do it. And Ben, was there one other that, those are the two main ones. Those are the two main ones, um, as well as, you know, forest products industry, exactly. which is, you know, been going through a whole flux of changes um, and the impact from, you know, the worldwide economy. So figuring out how do we support and foster, you know, a more sustainable Vermont brand of, of Vermont forest products. Which, of course, Hancock knows the issue there very well, having been through the warehouse or closing. That Jay? warehouse is closing. Is that what you said? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a warehouse. Okay. The what's it called? Hancock. Uh, not the water. building supply. Not it, the building supply. No, no. It's it's a, down here on the right, it's a big. Uh, it's a big factory. Factory. Oh, I see. Yeah. So Jay, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Uh, Jay Hooper. Well, that's actually a good um, transition topic because I'm serving on the House Ag and Forestry Committee. So Jay Hooper, represent. 
Brookfield, Braintree, Randolph, Granville, and Roxbury with Ben. Uh, uh, this week we had a cool uh, host of things that we got into, one of which was uh, visiting the farm show up in Essex. Um, some of the bills that Ag and Forestry are taking on are, uh, w this week we we pretty much got to the destination and the conversation around on-farm accessory businesses, or accessory on-farm businesses. So that'd be like uh, anything from a farm stand to a, to a slaughtering facility. Um, basically trying to level the playing field across the state so that town certain town bylaws don't uh, get in the way of farms' capacity to have a business. Um, there was a controversial section of that bill that was um, centered around weddings and events, uh, and a lot of the zoning administrators around the state weren't into that section, so we struck it. Uh, basically, it was going to give farmers real farms, uh, not just wedding facilities, the, the uh, basically the right to have weddings several times a year, but um, they're still allowed to do that, we just didn't keep that in the, in the, in the bill. Uh, another issue we took on this week was, and last week was hemp farming, that we took some testimony on, um, on hemp and the vitality of the hemp industry, but there isn't really a market right now in Vermont, and of course, as you must probably know, um, it's illegal to grow hemp. Uh, the, well, the federal law basically um, is in the way. So, like w one of the one of the obstacles on this issue is uh, for farmers who are looking into do growing hemp so that they can have an alternative source of income uh, is uh, that they can't get the seeds to to, to plant the crop. Um, but it is a serious cash crop, so it's kind of interesting to look into the viability of, of diving deeper into like a Vermont hemp market because a lot of farmers, uh, as you may know, are struggling with the milk market um, because that is uh, volatile and sort of stagnant. I think it's uh, $17.50 per hundred weight right now for conventional dairy. And uh, the organic milk market has been declining also because a lot of farmers have made the transition from conventional uh, practice to uh, organic. And so I think, uh, I don't know what the price is per hundred weight for them, but I think it's like $38 or something like that. Um, one of the most interesting topics we've taken on this year so far has been about regenerative ag practices. And uh, I've signed on to a bill that uh, Amy Sheldon put forth, she represents Middlebury. Uh, she uh, wants to have a $50,000 jump start program for, for farmers who are looking to, uh, a $50,000 allocation to help farmers who are looking to make the transition from conventional ag practices to organic, to regenerative uh, ag. But we took some testimony this week that was kind of startling to me because Apparently, within the regenerative agriculture movement, there's a lot of uh, disagreement about what it means to to have an organic farm, uh, what what that entails, what's allowed. Uh, I guess the, or there's uh, discord as to what it will mean to be certified organic. So um, I think that uh, it's kind of an interesting added tension considering the, uh, the inevitable tension between conventional dairy and organic as it, as it is, because a lot of the conventional uh, farmers are feeling attacked by the left or the, the liberals or you know, the environmental side of, of the discussion, because uh, as you may not be as aware down here, but closer to, I mean, as you get closer to Lake Champlain, the issue is more uh, talked about, but water quality is the number one. That's gonna be the heavy lift for, for the state and for ag.
to figure out how to fund uh, a cleanup effort that works for everybody. The farmers are responsible for 40% of the, of the runoff problem uh, and they feel like they're being charged with 90% of the solution, which is, uh, I guess, true in some respects. But, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, ha I'm not, I don't have a very fluid uh, presentation here. <laughs> so I'll, just, I'll, I'll just say, that starting I think next week in most of our committees, we start hearing the details of what um, Governor Scott is recommending in his budget. So we'll get our first look at the governor's budget for education and the education committee. I assume human services and agriculture are the same. And as we talk about great ideas, other things, um, we are, it's always against a backdrop of, of sort of an immediate uh, requirement by the governor, no new taxes, no new fees. He constantly repeats that. Um, that's, you know, if, if we say we want to focus on rural development or focus on something, that's a hard uh, nut to crack to be able to do both. Uh, we, everybody certainly understands the reason why um, we are saying no new taxes, no new fees. And in fact, the legislature last year uh, unanimously minus one passed a budget that did exactly that. Uh, and you know, I, think, I think we want to keep that in the background. But then we look at things like when we're uh, talking about rural development, there's a, a bill that, that our Rural Development Caucus is backing um, that would uh, tack on a half a percent increase in what they call a universal access fee. And that's one of those little lines on your landline phone bill. I'm not sure how big it is, it's maybe it's teeny. Yeah, and this would add a half a percent to it, but it could raise $1.2 million to help expand broadband in rural areas. And because um, basically broadband's an unre unregulated market, the state can't force anybody to do anything, and that's by federal law. Can't really usurp that. And uh, so the only way to get companies to expand broadband service or allow communities to try to do it on their own is to provide some money. But when they say no new money, it, it makes right, it hard. and I would say you know, going off internet because I think it's important in all of rural Vermont. You know, I've seen a real uh, you know dearth of leadership uh, in terms of getting the ball rolling to a plan that will provide uh, good broadband in the in the places that we don't have it. So I think this you know I signed on to the bill and with Peter and a number of other rural um, economic development folks would really jumpstart that conversation about how we're going to get there. So enough of us, yeah. I'd love to hear your questions if you have any, or comments, or, or. I have a question about um, the change in how special ed is funded. So pre you said that previously there was a lot of paperwork, a lot of accountability. Currently, yeah. Currently, right. Um, so what will be the accountability in this new system if school boards just get a, like a block so. grant yeah. type of thing? So how are they going yeah. to? So that's our that's our big issue as we as we work through this bill. It's very complicated um, to, to figure this out uh, because there's a lot of federal stuff. So accountability is the big issue. If you just give to a school instead of giving them their two and a half million dollars in special ed funding um, with lots and lots and lots of paperwork strings attached, maybe just give it to them. How you know they're not going to spend it on new carpeting? Uh, you know, first of all, the Agency of Education will continue, as it always has, to monitor special ed uh, progress. Um, most, all kids who are, quote, special ed are, are under contract, and an individual education plan is a, is a legal contract between the child and the education, and it's monitored <coughs> the federal law. So there's a lot of federal oversight, uh, and especially those who are on an IEP. Um, where you sort of have to move from a, a legal requirement basis to a faith basis in the fact that people who educate kids want to educate kids is in that more discretionary area of money where you might be having a math specialist or a reading specialist work intensively with a group of kids before they're on an IEP to prevent them from being on an IEP. And I think I feel comfortable, as I've heard more and more um, expert witnesses talk in our committee about it, uh, that uh, between the oversight at the state level and, frankly, the strong, strong desire of special educators to, to get to kids as early as possible and as effectively as possible, um, I have faith that, that it will work. Uh, 
right now we have a, kind of a, a reverse system in that um, the trend has been to hire paraeducators, not licensed teachers, to work with special ed kids on kind of a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one basis. They are not teaching specialists. Um, in many cases, they may not have even a bachelor's degree. They are dedicated, wonderful people. But in a way, we have um, the highest need children not being taught by the highest skilled teachers. I have a second question. Um, what's the chance that, that the changes to property, how property taxes um, calculated will pass this? It's looking very strong. So it's going to come out of the Ways and Means Committee. Um, with sort of how we can raise exactly what we're raising now. This is all for the education fund. And if you think about the education fund, all it really is, it, it's a, what we call a self-balancing fund. It takes in as much as communities vote to spend on education. So whatever that rate is, or how it's raised, is all set by the communities who vote for or against their budgets or cut their budgets or add to their budgets. It's not the state deciding on that, it's the, it's the communities. Um, and again, this would just sort of tinker with, it would better diversify the revenue that creates the education fund. So it's sales tax and income tax and property tax and lottery money and some other things. Um, but shifting a little from property to income more so than we have now. Anyway, it's gonna, it looks very good to come out of the um, Ways and Means Committee. It then comes to the Education Committee and um, We've been tasked with putting in the um, constraints. In other words, the, uh, to, they're just going to come up with a formula to how to raise the, all the money. Our job is to come in with the sort of um, throttling uh, so that people don't go crazy saying, hey, we know our, because you'll see your property tax rates plummet as a result of this. But of course, it's going to be made up on the income side. And so we don't want people to think oh, all of a sudden, oh my goodness, we can now go to town and spend all kinds of money. Again, you guys aren't in real control of your education spending. Um, but anyway, so we're in charge of putting the constraints on it so that um, we'll, we will continue to emphasize the need to have our spending reflect our declining enrollment in our schools. So when you're talking about income, do you mean the income that the town's getting or your individual income? Individual income, income it would be. And in fact, I think it even calls for pulling towns out of having to be the collection agency for income for uh, education taxes and instead you'd get a you'd get a, a separate bill so therefore people would really know the difference between their municipal taxes and their education taxes anyway it, it's it's looking it's looking good um, um, you know there it's there's a lot of Republicans who are very in, interested in this uh, it's a democratic controlled house and thus far um, they're satisfied with it. So we really hope that this will be a bipartisan um, um, program. What we've heard is that the governor is very clear. It can't result in new taxes and new fees, as he keeps repeating. Uh, so he doesn't want it to be used as a vehicle to start spending more on education um, at the state level or at the local level. And uh, so it's really going to be incumbent on us to put the the thresholds in place that will um, cost containment. That's the term I'm looking for. Put the cost containment measures on it. And so this process would be ready for the fiscal year of July 1st of this year? No. Uh, well, so that, there's a big amount of debate going on about that, whether we should spring it on folks this year and really just rip the Band-Aid off, let's make the move, let's make it happen, and potentially avoid a bunch of confusion where you've got dual taxing systems mm -hmm. going on for another year. And right on the other side, you've got, hey, you know, we can't handle all this at once. Um, have you decided what side of that debate you're on? No, I haven't. I haven't decided what side of that. That's a good question. I haven't. I would just yeah. add to that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's the education expert, but there's also pieces of the bill that would, uh, you know, better link communities with their local spending decisions, yeah. um, which I think has have contributed to attracting a wide amount of support um, because so better link voters with their local budget. And the way that by getting rid of the income sensitivity portion of what we have now, you know, now today you can, a lot of people are protected from whatever your school district wants to spend because they'll never have to pay more than 2% or 2.2% of their income on property taxes. So if you're spending $23,000 a kid on 
schooling when the statewide average is 15,000, you're kind of protected right now. In the future, the tax will become more progressive, so you still have a certain amount of progressive uh, of protection there, but you're gonna, everybody's gonna have skin, more skin in the game. Why would you say if money in is what controls that pool of money, money in going out, yeah. to be equal, why if there's only a 2% increase or so in spending that there's a projected 9% increase in the money needed? So uh, I, I would look at it differently. Um, I would say that it's, it's a four and a half cent increase last year, this year. Last year we took a bunch of <coughs> surplus money and one-time money and bought down the tax rate. So there was no increase in property, statewide property tax rates last year. Uh, and then so we're paying, now we're paying that price. You're paying for last year. Yeah, yeah. It was some, you know, there that was a lot of behind the scenes negotiations that went on to make a deal. Um, I would say many of us thought that was not a very good idea because now we're facing what we're facing. So and so the nine cent is also based on the idea that on the projection that um, school district or school spending, education spending is going to go up three point five percent on average statewide. Now, I haven't seen any of the budgets that have come in in the Addison County area or other ones I've read about in the paper that are going to come in that high. So I'm hoping that that's not going to prove to be true. Are you, are you looking at that um, teacher-student ratio much? Um, you know, we're so high, number one in the country, four, yeah. four kids for every teacher, well, that, for every professional, whatever. Mostly we argue about where the statistic come from, comes from. Uh, the 4.25, that's adults. Right. So that, includes, that includes bus drivers, yeah, everybody, custodians, you know, and, and our places that contract that labor out, counting it. So we have a lot of concern about that. But one thing we just know for sure is that we've got a declining enrollment in the vast majority of the state, and uh, we have not been keeping pace. Right, a huge declining enrollment and a huge increase in staff. Right. But yeah, or or over the last level, ten or fifteen years. Well, what we've really had in the last five is level staff. But decline to get so it's the same thing, yeah. Um, and so the question is, should the state be mandating how local school boards decide to staff their school systems? And I think that's a that's a big local control or issue. Mandate or encourage or yeah. you know, so you know, make a policy that you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the encouragement. So I'm the chair of the Middlebury area school board, and you know, one thing that unification has brought was is. Um, is the, is the ability to make broader decisions in a, in a big system. When you are the five member school board for a little school and you're looking at cutting a teacher, that's a, that's a hard thing to do. But when you have created a much larger system and you can move people around and you can make more strategic decisions. So in our district, we're, I think we were looking at cutting 21 full-time equivalent people. Um, a lot of that is through attrition. Right. Retirements. Right. And we, we had an early retirement benefit. So, you know, despite what we're hearing from folks on high, it's actually happening a lot at the local level. And a lot of it is because of the projected nine cent tax, uh, tax rate increase. But you're still projecting three and a half percent increase. Right. So I don't think that a three and a half percent increase is going to come true. Personally, in our district, $37 million budget, um, our per pupil spending is actually going down. And, no. and we have to be looking at that. We have to. What bothers me most, and I understand school education is important and all that, but I worry more about the senior people because they can't afford to stay in their homes. Mm -hmm. They have to go to a senior, sent, you know, assisted living or independent, whatever. And when I was growing up, we had so many widows here in town that could still maintain their home. And now that's not happening, all because of property taxes. Uh, it, you know, I think it's, well, it's, it's not just property taxes, it's, you know, well, serving. It's a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. but, yeah, uh, but, you know, I, I guess it, it, we have to look on a case-by-case -case basis because with income sensitivity, they should be protected from a large tax yeah, increase. I understand that, but I'm just trying to express yeah. my feeling that I feel bad that somebody who has worked all their life yeah. and then they're forced to go into a home because they can't afford their property taxes on the home that they've built or maintained through all these years. Yeah. I would also add to that that we um, we do a lot of other things that are counterintuitive to that mission as well. Like, for, for example, we tax some Social Security income. 
which doesn't make sense. So I, I was happy to see that in the governor's budget that they're going to start phasing that out, mm -hmm. taking a, a broader approach to see what contributes to a high cost of living. <coughs> the other thing I would say, and I think Peter would agree with me, is you look at our demographic shift, we have to do more to make sure we can attract and retain young people in rural areas. If we're looking for a long, you know, Vermont in 50 years, how do we make sure that we have vibrant communities? We need to be taking a proactive approach to that. Yeah. I think a big part of the problem is secondary education. We are focusing on pre-K, which is wonderful, but kids are coming out of school with extreme debt. They can't afford to work here. The jobs here don't pay. Mm -hmm. So I work, I work um, at Vermont Law School, and <clears throat> I counsel students as they're looking for work. Many students come from, I mean, Vermont law attracts people internationally. Um, and so uh, there are definitely those students who come in who don't expect to stay here. But then there are some that would really love to stay here, but the debt, the student, the secondary, I mean, the, um, the higher ed student loan debt is, oppressive I mean and there aren't very I mean I just don't see any relief coming for that there are some you're always like weighing that when they're making decisions they're going should I go into public service how long is that debt forgiveness going to be there are they going to get rid of that piece um, and so I think if we are able to um, figure out a way nationally to deal with um, higher ed education costs and being able to provide that education for people so that they're not starting out their lives with like this ridiculous debt. I have $100,000 in debt from my undergrad and graduate school. When will I ever pay that off? <laughs> Uh, and the drain on the economy, I mean, we hear about it all the time. <laughs> These are people who, can't, who can't, now can't qualify for mortgages because right. they are all their credit is taken up with paying off their student loans, so we have less home ownership. Um, you know, they just can't invest, and they have to struggle. It's yeah. very frustrating when we hear these businesses, especially in the Burlington area, saying we can't find qualified people. Well, we have a way. I work for Castle Community Action. It's a nonprofit that deals with people in poverty. A lot of our people, they're working, if they have their high school degree, if they're either a graduate from high school, they, they have no post-secondary education to be able to do those jobs. So how do we connect them with the training necessary to be able to get that job that will pay so that they're not working at McDonald's, which is not going to pay fair market rent in the state? So that's a, you know that's another thing that we deal with, both at the education committee level and then the um, Commerce Committee. We're all very interested in exactly this issue, and mostly focused around career and technical education. You know, we've got all of these great uh, technical education facilities throughout Vermont, and how do we get more kids to go there? Of course, we have fewer kids. Um, and you know, as I always say, when education, everything comes down to buses, and when you have technical centers that kids have to then you know go 45 minutes round trip to go to and spend half the day there and half the day at the other place. So we're looking a lot at how we can get get kids interested in a lot of these um, technical skills that we're so lacking. The, um, the you know post or the college education thing is a much tougher nut to crack because it's not a regulated industry and people make choices to go to places that they can't afford and borrow too much money. I'm not sure they have a lot of choice. Every place costs too much money. Um, you know we get. We get chastised constantly from the Vermont State College System and from UVM in the paltry amount that the state gives to support these um, areas of higher education. On the other hand, if we spend more on these places, taxes go up and then we make Vermont even harder to live in. So it's, it's a really hard balancing act. And one of the things I've heard from young professionals here in Vermont is that, and these are folks who have grown up here in Vermont, maybe they were first gen folks who went to college and have come back to raise their families here. My daughter's one of those. It's uh, a lack of support for young professionals yeah. in the sense that housing's too expensive, 
healthcare is expensive child and care. child care is different. I mean, there are child care right. deserts, yes. you know, in our community, especially in rural areas. So in terms of like finding a job that will pay you enough to cover your costs is more difficult here in Vermont. And I think that's um, definitely in supporting young families is how we grow our population and, and um, and definitely keep some of those folks here. Both Ben and, and Jay are young <laughs> right, you guys, native Vermonters. You guys I, was, I was once a young native Vermonter <laughs> as well, but uh, you guys can comment on yeah, that. Yeah, what I would say is I agree. You know, as a young person living in a rural area, it's tough. You know, and I think, yes, we have a lot to do on uh, the cost of living side. I think we also have a lot to do on how do we expand opportunities for young people to live in these communities. That's where I say, as a young person, um, in an increasingly global economy, connecting people, giving people access to high-speed internet really could be a, a, a target, you know, and an opportunity for Vermont because we have such a great quality of life. Um, people want to live here. We have good schools. We have a you know, small, tight-knit community. The question is, how do we connect people to opportunities so they can telecommute, you know, working <clears> from home, running a small business, you know, selling it on a, to a larger audience outside the state? I see that as one of the growth areas of where you know if we're looking to to build a more vibrant small town in rural settings that could be an area that we could attract you know the next generation you know what we're seeing now is you look at property values you know and you talk to realtors the first question that somebody you know a young family asks is do you have internet you know and you're seeing property values you know the house does not sell if you, if you don't have access to at least reliable um, type of you know, yeah, I'm, I'm a little I'm a little confused about <clears throat> the broadband and internet. You know, this area we've got 24 towns that are part of EC Fiber, yep. and Hancock and Granville are both going to have every pole wired next year or this year, so that everybody will have 100 meg or better speed internet. And I don't believe EC Fiber is getting any public support. This is a nonprofit that's set up and it's making money, and mm -hmm. the rates are are going to go down as they put more people on it, and yet. They're coming through these two rural towns this summer and stringing every pole with fiber. So I don't understand why we got to put more money, taxpayer money, in there if a thing like EC Fiber works so well in a very rural area where you know your density is far lower than what Verizon or Fairpoint or anybody else even looks at. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. I would say it really is a conversation about density, and if you if look at these two towns, we have no density. We have some of the least density in, in the state, and everybody's going to be able to have it from their pole. Not that they're going to have to string it for the last, you know, six people on a mile, or whatever. Right. But they're doing it, and, and I believe EC Fiber is totally nonprofit. They don't pay, they don't pay an executive a whole lot of money. They don't have a big staff. But they're, they're getting it done. So I don't understand the whole conversation about how it's so expensive. Yeah, I, I, you know, frankly, Hancock and Granville, because they're so hemmed in by the national forest, are actually denser than what you're going to find in the Northeast Kingdom um, and Wyndham even County. Franklin County. Wyndham County. Wyndham County, the southern part of the state, is definitely struggling with this. Uh, I think the number of residences, houses per mile, were one of the lowest. Yeah. So. Yeah. And EC Fiber, you know, I think, I think frankly, it's a, it's a community effort, and it's taken those people to get together and make it happen. <coughs> Your point's well taken. I'd, uh, I'd commend that you guys are focused on uh, uh, school spending and health care. That should take most of your time, and those are big issues. And the uh, development of the Internet is key, and it'll make these towns, uh, smaller towns like ours, uh, more economically viable. Keep in your mind, please, all three of you, mm -hmm. as you're funding things, uh, road conditions. Mm -hmm. I personally feel that rural uh, communities have roads that are all beat up a lot of the time, and it's a tax on us, really, because it beats up our cars and it makes it harder to do what we got to do. So as you go about your business, they're the big issues. Keep in the back of your mind every time you can, or come take a ride on Route 100 now and again between here and Rutland. We just got new asphalt on 125. It's great. In five years, come see it, because uh, we get all beat up, and it's, it's a tax on the people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, just to go one further, Dan, further than that, uh, you know, you take a look at our rural roads, our dirt roads, mm -hmm. and the regulations that are coming down, clean water, clean water is great, but it's costing, it's going to cost these towns so much money. And when you don't have a good tax base, we're poor communities. I mean, you know, a nickel on our taxes is, is, is a lot, and that doesn't raise a whole lot of money. 
And uh, you know, the regulations that are coming down that we have to do with our with our town roads. Yeah. It's extremely expensive, yeah. and um, I don't know how we're going to... No, we hear a lot about it. You talk about like the, the having to what, measure every 100 feet of your road. Well, we have 350 culverts or something, exactly. Yeah. You know, and a lot of them need to be re need yeah. work, okay? The, all the ditching requirements now that, that have come across. Um, you know, we've got to rock, you know, put the rocks in, and, and in 10 years they're going to be filled up, and you've got to take them out and put them back in again. You know, I'm not so sure what the real net effect is going to be on, you know, a clean water, you know. So on the on the topic of the cost of living, what do you all feel about a, a increase in minimum wage? I think it's a good idea. Yeah. You know, in, within the Senate, right? This is a Senate bill right now. It's a, it's it would be a kind of a, a six year or eight year phase in up to fifteen dollars an hour. My feeling is that probably the market force is going to drive it up to fifteen anyway. Yeah. Because I think there's uh, a bill to get it to 15 by 2022, right? And then there's uh, a Republican from Barry City uh, offered one for 2026, which would be more doable, I guess, for the rural, for the, for the Vermont economy. But uh, I guess I'm curious, yeah, do you all, is there a consensus in, in these communities that that's a good idea? Or is it? No, oh, I think it's always good to have more money. But you've got to stop and think, too, about your business people, your business owners. Mm -hmm. Can they afford to, to raise that with the amount of business that they have? Right. So I think I'm seeing is that we have folks that are making minimum wage. The fair market rent for a two-bedroom apartment, I think you would have to make in Rochester over on $20 an hour mm -hmm. to be able to, in a reasonable budget, to be able to afford it. You're making 10 bucks an hour. You're not going to be able to do that. That's a two-bedroom apartment. How do you make that work? So, so <laughs> folks are then having to come to apply for benefits. So, in order for them to meet their needs, tax money is then having to go to pay for food stamps, or it's having to pay for their health care, or it's having to pay for things that people can't take care of by themselves mm -hmm. because they can't make a wage that will cover those things. That the bare necessity. Yeah, I understand. And so how saying. do we, and, uh, and how do you balance the business side? In an area like this, you know, poor Diane up there, I mean, I don't know if she could afford to get up to $15. An Restaurants hour. different because if you receive tips, there's a different minimum yeah. for that. But what about Sarah? I mean, or JD's? There's, there's also the conversation that I would add to it that I think it's really starting to emerge in the Senate um, around, and we see it in healthcare all the time, is around the benefits cut. Um, because, you know, if you, if you take a step that would, you know, raise it to a certain level, there, there are some people that are going to be worse off, especially when you get into, um, you know, the, the child care credits and stuff. Um, as well as larger health care questions about subsidies and, you know, advanced premium tax credits. So I think. You know, it's an idea that's worth exploring, but there are many nuances once you get into, you know, shifting, um, you know, a base wage. My dad always said, you, if you can't make your rent in one week's pay, right. you won't make it. And those days are long gone. Yeah. There's, yeah. No, like, there's no way I can make my mortgage. Like, I mean, no, not in one week's pay. And that's the reality for most people. But... Um, your mortgage and taxes and insurance. Exactly. Exactly. So, but the thing is that, um, it, and I have a decent job <laughs> with benefits. Uh, I mean, for somebody who has, who is working minimum wage, that's it, that with the housing prices the way they are. Um, and if you have children and you work multiple jobs to cover your cost, which as a single mom, when I was a single mom here in Rochester, Hancock, Granville area, um, I worked multiple jobs and had to struggle to figure out which friend does my daughter go to today while I work and do I bring her with me? Do I have a job that I can bring her with me to? And, and those are real struggles that people have. So they're, even if they work more jobs to make more money, they're dealing with childcare issues and then they're dealing with the benefits cliff, which I had to deal with too in terms of like insurance. Once you make like, I think this was back in 2000, 
when I hit $17,000 a year, which is a ridiculous amount of money <laughs> to try and live on with a child, um, I lost my insurance. And then I couldn't afford insurance. And then I got really sick, had to go on, um, then I had to go on Medicaid because I lost my job because I got really sick. So it's a whole snowball effect that happens for people. You're, you raised it. Yeah, you, go ahead. You raised the minimum wage, say five years or four years, up to fifteen dollars a year. I have to do it again for twenty because that won't cover it. Right. It's just going to keep going, going, going. But I guess on that score, we're we're behind. That you know we're behind the pace of that inflationary right. impact You're as of now. Be. So, yeah. you know, you would think we, <clears throat> we are overdue to catch up, but, you know, can these small businesses handle it? And well, they, I just, they just go up under prices, which is going to make it worse for the, the customers. So the, the yeah, the economics of it are, are challenging, but I think that, that, that the, you know, the, the economists, at least the pro-wage you know, economists, would say that that actually still ends up being an economic plus. Mm. I've been kind of a supporter of raising the minimum wage, and then somebody said, well, you gotta remember that all of the people who are making $11, $12 an hour in our schools are also all gonna go up, that's gonna raise property or school education costs, and everybody's gonna yell at the schools for raising their budgets higher. Well, you know, where does it, where does it balance? And of course, I, one, in schools is we try to give those folks very good benefits mm -hmm. and that's sort of in exchange for a lower wage. But then uh, how do we balance that? So we're going to be kind to business and make it so it's affordable. The employee still doesn't make enough to pay their bills. And then that employee, though they're working 40 hours a week, 60 hours a week, whatever, trying to do their best is getting looked down upon by society and by mm -hmm. the community and say, you're taking our money because you're living on benefits. That person is doing their very best. So we need to shift the way we look at things then. If we're gonna say that we're okay subsidizing when business can't pay a person enough to pay their bills, that we accept the fact that we as a community are going to continue to support our community members and subsidize what that employer isn't paying them. But then also, the welfare system makes it so that people don't have to go out and work. No, no, I don't know. There's no. Did you want to say something? I did. Uh, and I'm here today to thank Peter. Um, I'm Robert Franks. I'm from Bethel. Okay. Uh, the reason I came to thank you is you were front porch forum notes that you put up a couple weeks ago, I believe. Now, just to give an idea of what you're doing up at the state house. That is the, that's the reason I'm here today. Communication and transparency. And today, Saturday, this beautiful day, is a great day for all of us to sit and celebrate democracy. Uh, I ride late this morning because my propane tank was frozen and I beat it to shower, so I was able to see you early. <laughs> they're, the, they're all the trials we go through. I live off the grid on the top of the mountain between Bethel and Rochester. I fought for seven years with Governor Shumlin, oh, any time I could find him with regards to high-speed internet. Mm -hmm. It is a major conduit to economic development. It, it's, it's incredibly serious. I have it through Fairpoint. It comes right through my phone line. So I'm always confused as to why EC Fiber is, why is it fair, why, why is it, if you have a phone line coming from Fairpoint in Granville, Hancock, I live off the grid way up miles from anything. I have high speed, thank God. Because for a while I couldn't afford that option on Fairpoint. And my brother Michael from Pennsylvania said, Robert, you need to get high speed. You, it's more important than food to be able to communicate. What's the highest high speed? Oh, it, it's pretty high. I don't know what the technical thing is. Yeah. yeah I don't even know what it is, but yeah, I know one thing. Important. Important. You, can, you can watch a movie. I can watch a movie. I can watch the Tales of Navy. I can okay. do all that stuff. But the other thing I wanted to talk about, and it's ironic, uh, because this economic uh, challenge in the, these valleys is, is confusing and challenging. But there's a few things, and ironically last night, I don't need to take too much time, but last night in Rochester, serendipitously, we crowd got together and we were talking. And we were talking about working and minimum wage. It, I think it should be called a livable wage. 
Mm. Not a minimum wage, because the eco economic development of a town or community will force the wage to be able to live. It, it's, a, it's a weird way to look at it. Rather than saying, we want a minimum wage, we want companies to be able to produce and manufacture as many products and get the economies of scale moving. And like you said, the minimum wage or the livable wage will rise according to the marketplace. We have no economic development in this valley. There's nothing. In my county, our Windsor Rutland County, uh, there's pretty much a directive. We don't want economic development. That was told to me by our state representative. We want grassroots companies growing. We don't want a company coming in from another town or another state or anything in this town. We want it to be grown, homegrown. Well, guess what? That's not happening. So, so that's a huge conversation. And I, I clean windows. And I know what I have to pay people to even for them to even show up. Mm. And guess what the number is? Twenty dollars an hour. You cannot even live. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, it's it's harder than that. Yeah. Okay. So the other concerns I have, we got into the conversation last night with this whole EBT card thing. Mm. I agree that there are people in need that need assistance. But here's the big question. Why does someone that has assistance using a car, and I need to know when this changed, why are they available to use it as cash, buy alcohol and cigarettes? Mm -hmm. That is a huge problem to stay out. So I don't know when that went into it. Like an EBT card should be for milk mm -hmm. and for the, for the groceries. But when you see people yeah. buying alcohol and cigarettes, yeah, and I'll be honest with you, I don't, I don't know how EBT cards work, and I think it's a generally federally controlled, yep. um, not state controlled. And I've, you know, I've heard people say that that's a myth, but I've also heard people say I've witnessed it. They get cash back because you can get cash on it somehow. Yeah, you can get cash back. So all of a sudden, your assistance can be used for anything you want, yeah. including. So, you know, for gasoline, great. But when you see someone getting cash back off their EBT card, then they go behind the liquor counter and buy a bottle of Jack Daniels. And then they have a balance on their on their EBT card with $840 in it. This is what happens. They leave the receipts. They don't even, they leave them on the counter. So this, the, the town knows that person on EBT has an $800 balance in their EBT card and buying Jack Daniels. Yeah. I think Some of it depends on what the benefit is. So if you're over the age of 60, you get cash, I think, instead of um, the, card. the card, maybe. And then uh, I think some people have a cash benefit. Some people, so if you have a wood benefit for a supplemental fuel, you get your wood. You have to come with a receipt to show that you paid for your wood. Now, people, I'm sure that there are people that do abuse that, um, but it might not just be a food benefit that they are pulling that from. Also, but how, how much do we police that? That's a big question. From what I understand, uh, this department at the state house level, uh, there's nine people being riffed, reduced to forces. So, like, what I'd like to know is, what is the demography like within your voting district that you? Oh, I had another question for you. Uh -huh. Oh, we should we should spread it around a bit too. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. How long have you been a state rep? Uh, the three of us have, have only been there one year, and. You know, this is that we're in our second session. Well, well, God bless you. So I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Do you believe your position seated as a state representative is a leadership position? Uh, I guess the answer to that would be yes. What it is we lead, I, you know, would be a, a harder question. I mean, it is we are in a leadership position in the sense that we help shape state policy. I think it depends on the issue, honestly. I think we're leaders. For our communities, you know, obviously we're working in cooperation up in the state house. That's the nature of democracy. Right, but when it comes to roads and school, you know, the reason I say I think it depends on the issue is because you know certain issues take leadership on a moral level or a, or a you know ideological level, whereas other things are all about what's at home. You know what? Yeah. And that's, and for me, I try to make my decisions mostly based on my constituents. So like, I'm willing to part with my own ideals to represent the majority on an issue, you know, back home. Um, does that answer your question at all? I, I guess it does, it helps um, in that, and again, the reason I'm here is because Peter was actually 
he took the time yeah. to communicate out to the people that voted for him, or even the people that didn't, to let them know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, totally. okay? yeah. But then the, the people of the towns need to be able to, like we are today, talk about issues, whatever those issues are. What I see in our, in our county, where I am, there's a total disconnect <laughs> from the voice. I have no clue how to even get in touch with my state rep. Yeah. Well, the internet's changed a lot of that. We're pretty easy to get a hold of. Yeah. Posting on front porch farm is, you know, not, not challenging. Um, right. So, so mm -hmm. I appreciate your, your appreciation, but to write a few paragraphs and put it on front porch farm is the, probably the least that we can do. I, I've been, I, I've seen him post as well, and Jay probably over his yeah. in the woods as well. It's actually great. It's, it's funny. Our front porch forum has had this culture of no politics, please, for some time. So we're trying to kind of overcome that. But I've got um, a radio talk show every Saturday. Are you uh, the guys from Braintree? Yeah. God yeah. bless you. I'm so excited when I heard you guys got in office. <laughs> well, I'm glad. Well, we so, need young people in there. Yeah. So every Saturday from 11 to noon, I talk on the radio with one or two guests about a specific issue. Today, it will be about child care. So maybe we'll take up the child care deserts uh, issue. But um, I'm going to give you my card. Well, thank you very much. Just so that and Yes, sir. Behind the camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am also a... Vermonter, voter, and in the holistic approach of our talk about wanting to see young people move to our state and have high quality education and $15 an hour and make this all work, let's not drop the ball on climate issues. Now, our governor just received a nice big check from uh, Volkswagen. We as a state are a collective group of people having a contract with a school busing company, and we have the power to say electric now. Mm -hmm. When we say electric now, we send a signal to young people who want their children to come to Vermont to be educated, because this is about the kids' future. And by the way, as a taxpayer, I don't know why the heck I'm spending money on education when we're killing the kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's get real about what this is about with climate change. And as a collective state, we can demand the school buses to be electric. By the way, we can have a conversion plant in Bethel. That company in New Hampshire can have the buses driven to Bethel, converted, creating jobs in Vermont. Our buses can be electric and our children can go, gee, our adults care. So please push on this issue. Thank you. There actually is a bill uh, that I know I signed on I to. I signed on also. That, that would uh, require that the Volkswagen money be used for um, the electric vehicle infrastructure. True. A lot of that talk is about plug, plugging in. Yeah. Forget that. We can do it. Go to Quebec Canada's websites. They have tons of electric school buses. Why? Because they have a lot of free electricity off those dams, yeah. which is causing environmental problems too. But it's not a mystery how to convert a school bus to electric. It's not difficult. Let's do it. Thank you. So yeah. speaking about vehicles, uh, what are your guys' feelings about this new seatbelt law and the new inspection uh, disaster? So <laughs> primary seatbelt law, uh, that bill passed with an overwhelming uh, affirm, you know, a, a, a vote for it. I think it was like 100. Um, it was like 135 to 15. Yeah, right? it was like seven or eight votes against. The House vote. Yeah. So the House vote to Senate. That's right. And um, I think that that is a bill that if it, if it saves five lives in a year because an officer pulls somebody over just to tell them, buckle up. You know, that's, I don't think that this is a method for police to, to, uh, you know, slap a fine on somebody. I think it's more of a, it, I, I am hoping that police will have the discretion to just use it to the safety of the driver and the, the passengers in those vehicles. Well, I think that should be a freedom that someone should decide on. Uh, seatbelt, I agree, the fatalities are, are, would go down, but I think it's another flag 
for more and more intrusion into people's private lives. I don't think, if I decide not to wear a seatbelt and I die in a car accident, that's my problem. Mm. It's not someone up at the state house. I, I'm thinking that it's being used for more intrusions. Like now we have tasers in the town. We have, it's like, how'd that get into town? Who proved that? So with all the digital recordings at every intersection, you can go to Burlington, there's cameras everywhere now. Okay, I forgot to put my seatbelt on and um, there's something else in my car or there's a, and all of a sudden I'm standing on the side of the road with my hands on. So I, I would, I would as, a, as an American citizen, uh, say, uh, let the person decide. Well, you know, it's it. actually, it was your representative, Sandy Haas, who uh, put in an amendment to make it so that, let's say somebody gets pulled over, and I think the, the example she used on the floor was, they reach into their, this woman reaches into her purse to get her license and the joint falls out. That is a non-driving related violation of law, and therefore, based on her amendment, shouldn't be to the police's availability in terms of, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I get that, I think that was a good uh, cause that Sandy put in there, but on the other hand, I still think it's an intrusion of the state police and the whole, the whole machine of this big brother and, and homeland security and everything going on. Mm -hmm. It's like, can we just live on our, drive our cars? And then we get to the inspection, there's another disaster. <laughs> That's a total, total. Yeah, that one was passed before we all got in there. But we, I mean, I personally think that that one is, a, it's robbing the faith of the mechanic. I mean, we should trust our mechanics to take care of that. Well, we're talking about people being able to afford uh, their children and living in their apartments, and now they can't even afford to drive a car that has a, 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 a an air valve broken in it. Yeah, no, this is, this is of interest to a lot of people, yeah. specifically for that reason, that um, we're flagging <laughs> issues with cars that it make, you know, so if it's a sensor that's out, it may cost $300 to fix the sensor, and the sensor's only job is to tell you what the other problem is, so you haven't even fixed the problem yet, and these generally are all emissions issues. Which, frankly, it's is killing. important, but it's, it is very expensive. Killing your rural reason. areas. You talk about people. Sure. You don't see very many nice new cars in Radisson, exactly. okay? So if you've got a 10-year-old car, you're almost automatically got a $1,000 bill every time you want to go get your car inspected now. And the it's car. not because of safety. It's not brakes. It's not clean air. It's, yeah. you know, yeah. because... Tire pressure sensors. Right. That's what yeah. been, a lot of people have been running into. Well, so, I think there is a, a, a lot of legislators that are, you know, interested in curtailing, you know, the inspections to a more safety level. Well, the thing now that it's all photographed and sent into DMV, so that, you know, the guy tells you you need brakes, well, you don't need brakes. You could go down to the next uh, inspection, and, you know, another another service the, area, the, the and, and they say you don't need brakes. Brake rotors in particular, and yeah. brake rotors and tire sensors seem to be the one that are really yeah. uh, getting people's attention. Well, I think this check engine light on, that yeah. you can't we, get inspected yeah. with a check engine. You know, we actually you can. We passed a bill I signed on, I don't know if you did, but uh, it was like one of the very first bills that I signed on to going into there, because I'll tell you what, in Roxbury, one of my our mm -hmm. five towns, and some of the mechanics were like, what the heck? Now we gotta take pictures of every segment but of then, the vehicle. But if you don't need brakes, I don't think there's an appeal process right now because there's, you know, it's certainly, um, you know, whether or not you need a new tire when it gets down to, you know, I mean, it's not bald, it's, it's still got another season on it, but some people say, well, I can't inspect it. And then that goes on the record so that you can go to the next mechanic and say your tires are fine and, and legitimately. Yeah. And maybe both of them had an argument, but I don't think there's a court of appeals no. once that goes to DMV. Right. You got to get it fixed. Well, the car I drove up in today is 25 years old. It's a Subaru Legacy. Good luck. <laughs> you know, you know what the great thing is about it? It falls below this disaster of all this inspection stuff. So I'm promoting everyone in Rochester <laughs> to import cars that before uh, 1995 <laughs> it supersedes the whole uh, mahogany <laughs> office up there in, in Burlington, in Montpelier. I, I wish the state of Vermont would have the referendum clause where the people can actually uh, say, it, we're, we're going to make the change. This yeah. force coming down from the, the uh, State House is 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 basically killing the state of Vermont mm -hmm. in all on, in all aspects: economic development, uh, inspections. What else do they want us to do? Uh, you know, trade old shoes in to, to, to get money for a hot dog. I mean, so I, as well, I wanted Jim is as our lone um, Granville resident here, wanted to give you an opportunity. If you had a question, yeah, actually, oh, Bruce, oh, Bruce, oh, Bruce, Bruce, I'm sorry, Bruce. But I will. Uh, 
say why I came down. Um, one of the struggles that we're having in our small town is, of course, people are aging, young people are moving out, and we no longer, in my opinion, um, have people who are qualified to do the municipal jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, it used to be, in all cases, you had to do a charter change in order to overcome that. In other words, all the important positions need to be, you need to be a resident. Yeah. Okay. Well, the state did, we had a problem with auditors. The state did change that, so we didn't have to go through that process. Um, the other one was the uh, listers. We changed that. What I'm saying is that we need that change so that you don't have to be a resident in order to be a road commissioner, for example. Almost every position with the exception of selectmen, I think, should be allowed to be done from the outside. Because we just don't, we don't have the qualified people. We went through that in Cornwall with, with our road commissioner. He moved on to another job. And, and is it safe there wasn't anybody in town? Who either wanted it or was qualified, and we ended up. Uh, I think the select board does have the power to change that to being a road foreman. Then you can hire from the outside. But then somebody still has to be the commissioner overseeing that person. It, yeah, it's a it's 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 an interesting point. I'm sure true. we're not the only town no. that has a problem. Would that be a state jurisdiction, or would it be town by town? State is. The, the state would have to yeah. make it so that you can. It does, yeah, it's probably a, so a statute. A, yeah. Yeah, and the town has to vote that they want to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. But, but it saves, gives them the flexibility. To right. It saves that big barrier of yeah. change your charter. Right. To what it is, it's just a barrier. That's great. It's very interesting. Um, municipal positions are getting more and more complicated. Um, there's a lot more uh, requirements that we have to um, address for the state. Um, a lot more forms to fill out, permits to apply for, uh, administration of grants is a lot more complex, especially if you apply for a federal grant, like we just did with the um, we got a CDBG uh, DR grant for the Churchville culvert. And the management and administration of that grant was very complex. And, and that's, um, you know, those are things that not everybody is capable of doing because they don't have to do it in their regular life. Yeah. Um, so that's that those things are becoming yeah. barriers I yeah. think. the other thing that would allow for example um hancock and granville could have the same road commissioner mm -hmm. maybe paid separately in two different jobs but it would allow that kind of overlap because the small towns just don't need that much the other uh, thing i was concerned about i saw uh, where the bills have been, uh, you know, introduced over the, since starting in January 2017. You guys got a lot of bills there. And they're on their own committee. Right. One of the first ones, and I should have written down the number of it, but it was to exempt Social Security wages from Vermont taxes. That, you know, that's over a year ago that was introduced. It's in Ways and Means, I assume. That's uh, Bill. Yep. Are you on that one? Yep. Yeah. Um, so What's that? that was so we're we're going to be digging into the governor's budget, um, but uh, if you heard his state of the state, he he said that they're going to begin moving towards that path to exempt social security. Uh -huh. So obviously the big question is how do you pay for it? You know because it is about thirty million dollars a year. Yeah. Um, but I was encouraged personally. <laughs> to see that he's taking a step in that direction because it just makes sense if we're taking into account, you know, our aging demographic and, you know, the cost of living, especially for, for seniors. Again, it's, it's a balancing, you know, I need to see more numbers on it myself. We are essentially uh, removing a tax from, unfortunately, what is our, our greatest population density. And that tax, if we're going to continue to raise the same amount of money, is going to get shifted to the tax burden of those people we're trying to keep here or attract to come here. Um, so again, it's, it's the hard balancing act. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of personal values. Right. 
Do you take care of your old folks or do you not? Do you take care of your children? No, really, well, there are no young people here to help take care of them, then it, it, it becomes <laughs> even harder. Right, that's for sure. What, what you got to you gotta cut the budget sometimes, too. Yes. Right. I mean, it's not just, uh, you know, uh, you know, you got less people, you got less less uh, money that people are making, and you keep saying how to shift on taxes. Well, maybe you cut $30 million. Yeah, I agree. <coughs> Yeah, oh, please. Um, we used to always say that you know the federal government can't mandate we do such and such without funding it. No. <laughs> right. That's what's <laughs> happening now, right? But the same thing is happening now with this whole cleanup thing in our roads. Yes. You guys say we got to spend another fifty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. There should be some funding with that. Well, we haven't been reimbursed for the work we've done in Irene. Yes. So, you know, this is now for over six months and we're still waiting. The state holds the FEMA money and waiting for the review of piles of paperwork, which is just ridiculous. How much, Bruce, is that figure? What, how much do they owe you? Right now, we're still owed about $20,000. Mm -hmm. And I think we're still owed some money as well. Yeah. I don't so, know the figure on that. And I realize some of these yeah. projects took years to finish, but it's been completed now. You know, yeah. last summer was the end of it, and we closed out, you know, the end of last summer. Yeah. And still haven't seen it. So now we got to budget this into our new budget for next year, because when are we going to see it? Yeah. Right. And, of course, the water quality issue and all that, that is also, you know, that's not just federally imposed. That's court imposed, you know, that, that, that we have to do this. And, I really, and the rule is that, the, is that if we don't do it as a state, the EPA is going to come in and tell us how to do it. Well, and FEMA has been maxed out. You know, we've got three projects in our town now that are waiting for approval from July 1st storms last year that amount to over half a million dollars, which is like three times what our annual road budget is, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and we're still waiting. they got to get repaired, you know? And they were obviously a washout from July 1st storm. It was a declaration. But that... You know, you can't have the state and feds agree on what has to be done and how much it's going to cost. You know, I mean, it leaves the town in a tough, tough spot. It's a similar, it's a similar situation in Hancock with the well, July. Well, Ripton has well, the same problem. Yeah. We only had we only had one uh, area on Facet Hill that was damaged, and so we were we were really lucky. That was um, the repair was uh, an amount that we could handle. But we're waiting for reimbursement for that. And it wasn't as much as what you guys have. I still would like to get back to the point of um, this um, high-speed internet, which is fine. I'm totally for it. But there's a lot of people, older people, or even young people that can't afford it. So therefore, they may not have known about this meeting today. Because I only saw it on Front Porch Forum. I did hear that there was a poster at Hancock, the store. But I didn't see anything at the post office. I, I saw. Uh, I saw. So there's one. There's one. I put one up at the restaurant, at the store, left one here at the town clerk's office to put up at the library. Uh, I, yeah, did not, I, did, I did not do the post office because um, I came by after hours and just stick it up. Just stick it up. Yeah. There. And then there, then there were a few at the same locations. But I'm also going to say that I think it helps to make a physical appearance in the towns that you represent. Yeah. <laughs> not just through. Computers, because yeah. not everybody has a computer. Yeah. So I think you need to come into town and go to the various businesses, or just walk through town, meet up with people, mm -hmm. and tell them who you are. And sure. they may be able to express. They might feel better about expressing what they're concerned about what what? better than coming to a meeting. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've been trying to schedule a public forum on minimum wage specifically, but whatever else. Anybody would like to chat about in Roxbury, uh, so I could do my best to keep Granville posted. That's not very easy to get to, I'm sure. But, um, there's uh, Granville's having a uh, legislative breakfast I think next Saturday, the right. following Saturday. Well, it's on Monday morning, uh, Monday. February. East, uh, East Granville. Yeah. Okay. So oh, that's yeah. no, 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 no. This is this yeah, is the Addison oh, County Grange. Okay. Um, yeah. Addison County Grange. Is, they they have a legislative breakfast. Uh, every Monday throughout the legislative session, and they move it around the county. And uh, this year, they decided to hop over the mountain and, and do it at the. I think and why do they pick Monday? Because that's a work day. Uh, because well, they do it at 7:30 in the morning, 
and, and the main reason <laughs> is, well, you can take it up with them. Uh, <laughs> they do it all over the state, but there are a lot of legislative breakfasts. At but anyway, the reason is Monday. No, but they're always on Monday. Well, that's because that's when the legislators are at, right. at the state house. And when is this? So this is um, February 11th. 11th. Monday, February. Is that the a great house? Range? 12th. 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 At the Grand Bill Grange. So why is today's meeting? Do you know it? Why is today's meeting on Saturday? I, I thought it was really refreshing not to be pressured to be somewhere else. Like no, this is just something the three of us set up. I think, it's, I think it's great to have it on a Saturday morning going towards your. Well, party. that's what I meant about yeah. the legislative breakfast. Why yeah. not on Monday? Yeah. Well, you can take that up with well, the range. I knew you tried to do this last year around this time, and it didn't come. It's, we got snowed out. Right. Yeah, yeah. but uh, we would totally be glad to come and have. I mean, this is a very robust discussion. You guys have a lot to. And you guys really come to all the town town meetings too, so yeah. I think that's important. But I, but I certainly get an earful at the town meetings. I'll tell you what, one of my campaign promises was uh, that I hope to make Granville and Roxbury feel more included in the process because I know our three towns in Orange are, get a lot more attention because we're over there. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a funny district. I mean, yeah. we, we represent an interesting geographic district. It looks great on map, but then you, you look yeah. at some of that. Can well, we yeah, I mean, East Granville? Can you do something with East Granville? Yeah. East Granville is over the mountain. Yeah. It takes 45 minutes to get there. Mm -hmm. There's a small few residences there. And All it would make people. much more sense to go with Randolph or Frank here. You know, and I'm not throwing them under the bus or anything like that, but we can't provide services. Right. It is. It, I've, I've filled a number of things in, in uh, Roxbury. And Nobody wants it. Yeah. Because it's all rental housing for the most part, right? And, well, and it's not the top end housing. Yeah. Well, if it's you go to Middlebury, land, really. you talk to people in Middlebury, they don't know where Hancock is. And people live there all their life. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a, a big issue for these, for this valley is yeah. okay. when somebody applies for services, mm -hmm. sometimes they will go over to Randolph, because that's where they go for their med some some folks go for their medical care there, and then they'll say, "Oh no, you're in Hancock or Granville. We don't service that area. You have to go all the way over to Middlebury." Yeah. Well, get that's to where the services are. are. So yeah, Stone Covers, Hancock, yes. Granville, right. Rochester, then, that's our catchment area, and Clara Martin Center is supposed to cover that as well. Yeah. But ESD, Economic Services yeah. Division, you're in Addison County. You've got to go to Middlebury. Right. Rochester has to go down White River. Right. Exactly. I know that. Yeah. No, yeah. We don't have an ESD office in Orange County. This, this has been a problem time since, since yeah. the dawn of time. <laughs> and they drew those crazy lines, East Granville being the craziest part of the crazy lines. Yeah. Well, so, Tavis and County is where it's good. Yeah. Well, I'd just like to say thank you guys for coming. Um, but I also want to encourage folks that um, if if you have the chance, and I know it's difficult if you when you're working, um, if there's something, keep try and keep on track of what's going on in Montpelier. Sometimes there are specific days when constituents are called in, like there's like well, uh, yeah, childcare day. There's a good example. This past week, uh, the place was flooded with orange because there was a gun or a couple gun bills that all the hunters came out of the woods to say, <laughs> we don't need any more. <laughs> Gun laws. But the fact is that uh, if, if, you, if you folks haven't had a chance to go to the Capitol, I mean, it is wide open. You can go yeah. anywhere you want. You can sit We're all very and available. And, it's know. amazing. Yeah, it's a very yeah. public place, but a lot of people don't know that. And even the people who do know that aren't necessarily, they don't feel like ushered in. It's sort of, you have to have the gumption to go into and sit down. And, you know, yeah. I'd like to also say that now that Orca and other community access is available, they are filming all the meetings at the State House. So all of them? Oh, they're going nuts right now. It's good. In there. That's great. Yeah. That way you can so You're doing a great job with this stuff, too. Well, thank going you. down to select board meetings, and I don't know how you're putting it all the time, but uh, it's great that you have a lot of time. Hot wage. Well, <laughs> you got to come on up to this end of the valley sometimes, too, you know? <laughs> well, thank you. So you can, it's a, uh, the state house is really an open place, as you mentioned, and um, you can go into committee meetings, hear what's going on. You can't talk, but you can listen to what's happening. They're they're kind of tight and small, yeah. and but it's very it's intimate. Very yeah. intimate, but it's really and worth, during cold season, it's a little dangerous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's really worth the time and effort to go and and spend some time up there to hear what's going on and. Definitely, like go up to the cafeteria because that's where a lot of the work happens. 
and um, it's yeah, it's a. Um, I always feel really energized when I go up there. That's good. It is. I mean, we are truly a citizen democracy. We're only there for four and a half months. Uh, we all have jobs outside of it. Um, yeah. My job this summer was just above minimum wage, so I, that's why I kind of wanted to probe that conversation. It was a financially stressful summer, which was a good. I did that on purpose to understand. You know, what do you do for your full time? So um, th th this summer, in the interim, uh, I worked at the Veterans Cemetery in Randolph Center, um, digging graves and mowing and uh, you know, maintenance. Um, so I was kind of double dipping as a state employee, but uh, uh, it was a good experience to, to firstly familiarize myself with the, the conservative culture of you know, the, the military. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, get a little bit of exposure to, to that type of thing. Right. Um, and what do you do? I work uh, another seasonal job, which you kind of have to with the legislature. So I work at uh, Montague Golf Course in Randolph. Um, I also, uh, I started a, a nonprofit mentoring program in Randolph. So that takes up a good amount of my time as well. And I know you're involved with the education over there. Well, I'm a, that's a volunteer. I'm a school board member over oh. there. Yeah. No, I run a small business. Um, you can see my funny looking orange van in the parking lot. Uh, this is my third career since uh, I've been in Addison County anyway. Um, but it's a small move management company. We help folks who may not have the family or friend support to help move to organize and moves and help them downsize, clean up, pack, and go from full to empty. You're so, uh, downsize. <laughs> That question for you too. How they treat you for gun guns? <laughs> <laughs> no, serious. A lot of rising, you know. They they'll uh, pick on me about my hairdo, or if I'm two minutes later, how much I'm eating at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that at least I felt taken seriously, which I appreciated um, from a policy perspective in the, in the in the discussion. You know, we are outliers. You look at the average age; it is much higher. Um, but I think I think a lot of people, both in Montpelier and outside, recognize the need, you know, for a, a, a broader conversation. More people uh, and, a, and a more diverse group uh, making decisions. So, I will say, as a, as a more senior one, uh, no. it, it, it is um, it is great having younger folks in the legislature and having their perspective as we focus on how we retain and attract young people to Vermont. I've got three sons. 25 to 16, uh, one's in Chicago. He's a typical millennial in the sense that his desire was to be in a walkable urban area. Um, he also is engaged to somebody from the Midwest. That's where all their friends are. He went to college in the Midwest. Working really hard to get them back. The, yeah. other ones, uh, <laughs> the other ones in law school accumulating mountains of debt um, <laughs> out in California. We'll see what happens with that. but. My wife and I both grew up in Vermont, and you know this is where we chose to, to stay. Um, and you know it's always been hard. You know, if it were easy to live in Vermont, you'd make a lot of money. We'd have five million people here. It just seems like it's gotten a lot harder. But I wanted to ask you guys, being young guys at the state house. Um, Are you including me in this car? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good, Peter. I know. I'm just wondering, as young people representing the people. If you introduce a bill, do you feel as a young person you're respect, respected by other representatives and what you're what you're trying to promote, or do they kind of say, "Well, you're just this young guy and you know you're too green to be"? Yeah. I can I can only speak for me. You know, yeah. I'm on the healthcare committee, which you know is where a lot of the policy making happens. Yeah. Um, you know, I think if you're willing to dive in and prove yourself policy-wise, people do take you seriously. So I felt like I've had the opportunity to, to put meaningful input into, you know, healthcare-related bills um, and not been, you know, dismissed as just a young guy. So you feel I, I feel like, yes, I'm I'm taken as seriously as any other representative. Well, as I should. Hear that. Yeah. yeah, no, that, that is true. Um, and even in other spheres. Uh, it was funny, there was one time I went to the to the National Life Building to consult the Agency of Tourism for a map of Randolph. And they didn't give me the time of day because I walked in in plain clothing, you know. And then finally I told them I was a representative and all of a sudden now I had a map. And, I was like, and it was so so we're we're taking serious 
seriously in, in a lot of capacities. But as Ben said, we are valued also on certain, certain, in certain areas. Like uh, for instance, the other day the governor called in the, the dozen or so millennials from the from the House chamber to come and discuss uh, youth exodus and how we reverse demographical, you know, trends uh, based on. Uh, data and technology that is more understood by, more easily understood by us younger guys. How so, old are you? I'm 24. Wow, how 23. Wow, that's good. I'm 28. Of course, I look. <laughs> <laughs> Most people think that I'm the youngest because I, I'd say Ben looks a little bit older than me. So, <laughs> so I'm totally OK with that. I have to run. Thank you, gentlemen. Oh, yeah, thank so you for coming. coming. No, um, but it, but uh, you know, it is, it, I'll tell you, on the issues where I am more ignorant uh, than older folks, uh, that becomes both an asset and a uh, mm -hmm. disadvantage. Because at times, you know, I can I can ask a question that others can't, you know, and right. uh, get away with it. While you know, I also have to tread lightly on certain things. Yeah, grab a couple of donuts. Thank you. <laughs> I'll tell you what. The property tax issue going in has been. I've been very tried to be very sensitive to that. Um, so that's why you know, the first the first time around when the governor was battling with the teachers, I sat with the governor because uh, I said, okay, the Democrats haven't necessarily presented an alternative that's superior. So I, I, I'm going to go with this. Uh, congratulations, guys. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks all of you for coming this morning. We have yeah. to wrap up at 10.30 and happy to stick around and chat as much as you like, but uh, don't want you to feel obligated to sit here any longer. <laughs> yeah, actually, I got to go to get on my radio show.